Hello, on this channel, we normally feature slow moving and relatively sluggish electric aircraft, but given that our viewers are aviation enthusiasts and to celebrate the release of the movie Top Gun Maverick, we made this video to explain the high speed aerodynamics that is part of the film. In this video, we will cover the limitation and capabilities of the aircraft shown in the movie, discuss the aerial combat maneuvers, and share relevant fun facts. So without further ado, let's begin. First and foremost, we must understand the Mach number and how its change impacts the way we design and fly our aircraft. We often correlate the speed of sound in meter per second or kilometers per hour or miles per hour with the Mach number. For example, it is often cited that the speed of sound in the air is 343 meters per second, and we understand that any speed below this would be termed as subsonic, any speed above this is supersonic, and exactly this speed is called sonic speed. But the value of 343 meters per second is based on mean sea level pressure and at 20 degrees centigrade temperature. The speed of sound changes with ambient air pressure and temperature, and both of these parameters change with altitude. So, while the speed of sound may well be 343 meters per second or 761 miles per hour at sea level, it is different at higher altitudes at which the aircraft flies. For instance, at 11,000 to 20,000 meters, at which commercial and fighter jets fly, the speed of sound is slower at around 660 miles per hour or 295 meters per second. This is mainly because of the low temperature of minus 57 degrees centigrade at that altitude. The table here shows this variation of speed of sound with altitude. When we want to reach hypersonic speed or speed that is more than five times the speed of sound, then the aircraft such as the Dark Star shown in the movie has to fly at higher altitudes of 25,000 meters to 29,000 meters. The speed of sound at that level is slightly higher, that is 301 meters per second or 671 miles per hour because the temperature begins to rise with further elevation towards the end of the stratosphere. So far, the only manned aircraft to fly in the low hypersonic regime were the X-15 and the Space Shuttle during re-entry. Normal turbine jets are capable of taking us from zero speed to Mach 3.5. A ramjet is then used to reach the speeds of up to Mach 5. For speeds higher than Mach 5, a scramjet is used. An aircraft such as the SR-71 has a two-in-one engine, that is, it has both a turbine jet and a ramjet housed in a single nacelle. To get the aircraft from takeoff to supersonic speeds, the turbine jet is used. Once supersonic speed is achieved, then the ramjet kicks in. At this point, the flow through the turbine jet is bypassed by using valves, and ramjet provides further acceleration. Interestingly, the ramjet has no moving parts. The Dark Star hypersonic aircraft in Top Gun Maverick is also shown to have a dual propulsion system. It has a turbine jet that takes it from takeoff to supersonic speed and thereafter the scramjet takes over. Note that neither the scramjets nor ramjets can operate efficiently when they are traveling below Mach 2 or Mach 3. Interestingly, the upper speed limit at which the scramjet can accelerate the aircraft to is still unknown but we know that unmanned aircraft with scramjets have reached up to Mach 10. What is important to note is that flow behavior changes drastically as the speed increases from subsonic to supersonic. For this reason, the jet nozzles need to have a different shape in a subsonic regime as opposed to when the flow is supersonic. It is a common observation that flow can be sped up using a converging shaped nozzle. This we would have experienced by pressing down at the end of a garden hose and watching the water spray speed up. On the other hand, when we notice the nozzles at the end of a rocket or a space shuttle, we find that they aren't convergent but have a divergent shape. Why would that be? The reason is the complete change of flow behavior in the subsonic and the supersonic regimes. In the subsonic regime, a diverging nozzle or a diverging section in a pipe would slow down the flow and increase the pressure. 
And as mentioned earlier, if the nozzle is converging, then the flow accelerates. But this situation completely reverses in the supersonic regime. It is very non-intuitive, but the supersonic flow in a converging section decelerates, whereas in a diverging section, it speeds up. As the flow coming out of the rocket nozzle is supersonic, the shape of the nozzle is very different. There is a reason why commercial passenger jets fly just below the sonic limit. We would need a completely different shape to operate efficiently in the supersonic regime. If you cast your mind back to the ramjet and scramjets, it was mentioned that they require supersonic flow at the inlet. This is because they are shaped exactly opposite to the turbine jet. They have converging section at the inlet to compress the flow. And this also brings us to the nozzle of the F-14 Tomcat. Modern fighter jets have a variable nozzle shape. The nozzle can be made to remain convergent in the subsonic regime and can transition to a diverging shape in the supersonic regime. You might have seen videos of nozzles changing shapes during the pre-flight checks. The new generation of aircraft can not only change the shape of the nozzle, but also tilt the axis of the outcoming jet for thrust vectoring. The fifth generation Russian jets in particular use this capability. Both the F-14 and its replacement, the F-A-18 Hornet, don't have thrust vectoring capability. Which brings us nicely to the topic of maneuverability that is a major part of the movie. The importance of maneuverability cannot be understated, especially in this day and age of long-range missiles. Note that a fighter plane cannot outrun both an air-to-air -air or surface-to-air missile, which can travel at speeds of up to Mach 4. It can, however, outmaneuver a missile, and while doing that, its slower speed compared to the missile actually helps it being more agile. Now, the aircraft's agility is largely dependent upon its size. The general principle is the larger the aircraft, the less maneuverable it is. And this is because of the high moment of inertia, which increases cubically as the dimensions of either the length or the wingspan increase. For this reason, the F-14, which is a 20 meter long aircraft, with a 20 meter unswept wingspan was pitted against just a 12.2 meter long Douglas A4 that has a wingspan of only 8.4 meters at the actual Top Gun Fighter Weapons School. The F-14 dogfight exercises were also carried out against supersonic but much smaller F-5 which had 14.6 meter length and 8.1 meter wingspan and the F-16 which had a 15 meter length and 10 meter wingspan before the F-14 retired in 2006. So if small size is the key parameter for high maneuverability, then why is the Su-57 Felon, which is a 20.1 meter long aircraft and is even longer than the F-14, falls in the category of aircraft which are called super maneuverable. So how is that possible? Well, it is possible through the use of thrust vectoring, immense engine power with high thrust to weight ratio, twin variable control engines, large flaps, slats, and other control surfaces. To make the F-14 Tomcat more agile, and in particular at high speeds, the aircraft wings sweep back, which allows it to roll quicker. And while performing maneuvers like the Cobra, its wings sweep out and the engine power is rapidly decreased and then increased. So in the F-14, the maneuverability is achieved by changing the aircraft profile and manipulating engine power. Although by varying the individual output from each of the two engines it has, spin could also be achieved, but intentional flat spin was prohibited in the F-14 as it was difficult to recover from. Interestingly, we can see the modern Su-27 in air shows performing intentional spin maneuvers. The evasive maneuver of the enemy Su-57 is one of the highlights of Top Gun Maverick. It can be best described as a Cobra maneuver with a vertical flat spin. This is not a classical aerial combat maneuver, and it is one that has been made possible only through the most advanced aircraft propulsion technology as it requires unsymmetrical thrust vectoring. While the detractors of super maneuverability will argue against its usefulness, 
Nonetheless, some of the maneuvers one can perform with it are a spectacle and a sight to behold. One of the features of the F-18 that differentiates it from the F-14 is the use of canted tails. The canted fin stabilizer improves the maneuverability at low speeds and at high angles of attack. It is for this reason canted tails are also found in the Su-57 and the F-22 Raptor. The F-22 is also known for its high maneuverability. And finally, here is some bonus information. A flying ace in aviation terms is a title given to someone credited for shooting down five or more enemy aircraft during aerial combat. And with this, the video is concluded. If you learned anything from it, then please do give it a thumbs up. Enjoy the movie. Thank you for your attention.